Thank you. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn with me to that portion of Scripture which we read just a moment ago in Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, on this Memorial Day Sunday, we are exhorted by Paul writing to young Titus to remember the things that you were taught. There are certain memorials that are very important for the believer. Memorial Day is a wonderful time of the year. It, it reminds us of the great freedoms that we have here in the United States, which were bought at the price of blood. Memorial Day, also called Decoration Day, when the graves of Civil War soldiers are decorated with flowers in their memory, goes back to the Civil War. In the United States, the northern states originally celebrated May 30th in memory of the northern soldiers killed in the Civil War and subsequently in later wars. Before the close of the Civil War, some of the southern states also took up the practice of celebrating May 30th. It was made official by the then Commander-in-Chief, John A. Logan, of the Grand Army of the Republic, designating May 30th, 1868, quote, for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion. It was first passed into law in Rhode Island in 1874, Vermont in 1876, New Hampshire in 1877. By 1950, it was recognized in all the states and territories except Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Texas. In Virginia, May 30th was regarded as Confederate Memorial Day. In addition to the celebration of the National Memorial Day, Confederate Memorial Days are celebrated in Louisiana, Tennessee, and Arkansas on June the 3rd, which is the birthday of Jefferson Davis, for those of you who are history buffs. He was the president of the Confederacy. In Alabama, Florida, Georgia, and Mississippi on April 26th, and in North and South Carolina on May 10th. But they all celebrate a Memorial Day. And they all celebrate one in relation to our national wars since that time. Human memorials are designed to remind the living about the dead. They're designed to keep us on guard. They're designed to make sure that the lessons of the past are learned well. They're designed to keep us from repeating the mistakes of former generations. They're designed to give us a sense of continuity of the identity of our people as a people. Last year, we looked at memorials from the divine viewpoint and saw 17 purposes for divine memorials. They remind us about the character of God. They remind us about the works of God. They remind us about the law of God. They remind us about the word of God. They remind us of the holy service that we as God's holy people are obligated to do. They remind us of our right of access into the divine presence by the blood of Christ. They remind us of the cost of redemption by the blood of Christ. They remind us of God's promise of the regathering of Israel to its homeland in preparation for the return of Christ at the second coming. They remind us of the typology of Christ as the bread of life and of his deity. They show us that God will not accept unholy service or service by unbelievers. Those divine memorials remind us of our obligations to bring the best of our offerings to the Lord. They remind us of the omnipotent power and mighty acts of God on behalf of his people. Divine memorials remind God's people that we are to be a separated people, as you see on the wall behind us here. Divine memorials remind God's people that he will destroy their enemies before them and protect them. Divine memorials remind God's people that human memorials will perish but divine memorials are everlasting. Divine memorials remind God's people that the Lord himself and his name is given to us for a memorial. 
And as we mentioned a moment ago in the prayer, we have been given a special divine memorial which we celebrate together next week, which is the Lord's table. That was last year. Those were the things from the divine perspective, the memorials that God has given to remind us about him and what he has done and to never give up hope because we as his people have a sovereign God who rules the universe. This year, we want to look at the things that God wants for us to keep in memory because they are so essential for our practical Christian living. Now, different groups of people have things that are passed from generation to generation so that the memory of those things will never be lost. Throughout the time that Israel was dispersed among the nations, they kept in mind Jerusalem. And every Passover, they would say, next year in Jerusalem. Today, the Israel Defense Forest has an induction ceremony at the top of Masada, and the new troops are sworn in with the chant, never again Masada. And they remember what the Romans did as they destroyed that final remnant of 900 Jews who had managed to withstand the Roman onslaught for several years until the Romans built a ramp up to the top of Masada down near the Dead Sea and breached the wall. And all the Jews, taking an oath among themselves, killed one another and each man killed his own family before his comrade killed him. And only a few women were left in a cistern who gave the story so that we know it today. Never again, Masada. Things kept in memory for the preservation of a people. There are certain things that God has given to Christian believers to keep in mind, to remember so that we will be doctrinally articulate and so that we will live a life that is pleasing to God. In the human realm, we remember the past so that we will not be doomed to repeat it, as historian Arnold Toynbee has said. From the Bible, we have exhortations that we are to remember the eternal realm, word of God so that we can serve God in time present and throughout eternity, not merely so that we will preserve the past. In our text today, we read that first phrase, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers, Titus 1.9. Paul is telling Titus and therefore likewise telling us that we are to remember what we have been taught. The following phrase and the remainder of the verses in that passage tell us what results from holding on to the scriptures as we have been taught. That he may be able by sound doctrine. Sound doctrine, how important that is. There is only one source of sound doctrine, and that is the Bible. If you forget what the Bible says, you will soon wander into false doctrine. When you get off the path of the word of God, soon you're in the jungles of darkness. Anything that deviates from the Bible is false doctrine. Never forget that. If I say something that deviates from the Bible, it is false doctrine. If Martin Luther said something that deviates from the Bible, it is false doctrine. If John Wesley said something that deviates from the Bible, it is false doctrine. If John Calvin even said something that deviates from the Bible, it is false doctrine. Be like the Berean Christians in Acts chapter 17 who tested everything by the Bible. They even tested Paul by the Bible. In Acts 17, verse 10 and following, and the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who, coming thither, went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, 
in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed, also of the honorable women which were Greeks and of men, not a few. They heard Paul. It was an exciting message. It was a wonderful message about salvation in Christ. It was a message based on the Old Testament scriptures and the, the great prophecies of the Old Testament concerning who the Messiah would be, what he would be like, what he would do. The fact that he was, in fact, God come in the flesh. And so they heard this message that he had died for their sins, had been buried and had risen again from the dead, and was giving freely eternal life to everyone who believed. They received it readily, but they checked it out. It was a wonderful message. It was a true message. They discovered it was exactly what the word of God taught. That they may be able by sound doctrine. Hold fast the things that you have been taught. Remember what you've been taught. But been taught from whence? From the scriptures. That they may be able by sound doctrine. Doctrine is the teaching of the word of God. If there is anything that is contrary to the word of God, it is false doctrine. If there is anything that tells you to do something that the scripture prohibits, or prohibits you from doing something that the scripture commands, it is false doctrine. If there is any doctrine that teaches you to live in a way that the Bible says is immoral or sinful, it is false doctrine. Holding fast what? The faithful word, that is the Bible. Holding fast the faithful word. Oh, dear people, do you hold it fast? What is it that's in your grasp? What collection of ideas from multiple different sources have you bundled together to try to run your life on that basis? Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. There's a purpose in well-memorized scripture. Do you have a scripture memory program? I started a scripture memory program when I was a tiny child. My parents introduced it to me, and ever since then I have memorized scripture. Sometimes I can't remember exactly where it's found, but I can quote it to you. Holding fast the faithful word. Are you memorizing scripture on a daily basis? Do you try to commit at least one verse a week to memory? The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The scripture is your sword with which you do battle in the spiritual realm. Oh, that you might have it hidden in your heart. The word of God. You must hold fast the faithful word. It does not say hold fa fast the faithful catechism or hold fast the faithful confession. Those are secondary sources. It says to hold fast the faithful word. Memorize the scripture. That is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It is the scripture that gives you sound doctrine. That word hold fast is the Greek word antekomai. It means to adhere to something, you know, stick to it like glue. Adhere means to stick. <laughs> You're going to stick to the scriptures like glue. To cling tenaciously, make it part of your life, weave it into your being. Glue your brain to the Bible so that you can function on automatic Bible pilot when things in life get chaotic. And when the enemy is shooting at your plane, you can go on automatic Bible pilot because it's ingrained in you. Hold fast the faithful word. It is the faithful word. It is the word that never fails you in times of crisis or in times of debate against the gainsayers, which is the context here in our text today. There is the purpose 
for that memory of Scripture taught or memorized, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine two things. Here's the purpose. Both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now there are many reasons for memorizing Scripture. We have two of them set forth for us today. For example, we have others. We're commanded to memorize Scripture because it keeps us from sin. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119, 11. The two verses immediately preceding that, verses 9 and 10, tells us that, that we should memorize Scripture because it keeps our way clean. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto, according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thine understandings. Our text today gives us other reasons for memorizing Scripture. Exhorting gainsayers. Convincing gainsayers. And you say, what in the world is a gainsayer? It's not a word we use a whole lot today. But a gainsayer is somebody who speaks against something. And here, in the context, it's obviously someone who is speaking against sound doctrine, which is based upon the faithful word. The word exhorting here is a really interesting word, because we might not have expected it in this particular context. It's the word that means to call alongside, perakaleo. The noun form of that word, in fact, is used of the Holy Spirit who is called alongside us to help us, the paraclete. It's sometimes translated beseech. It's a courteous word. You see, the first thing that when we find someone who is teaching false doctrine, the first thing that we do is we treat them with courtesy. We beseech them based on scripture. Our goal is to rescue those who are ignorant of sound doctrine. That's not how we treat apostates. That's a different matter. But even here in this passage, where Paul is telling Titus to deal with some pretty rough characters, he is to start with exhorting, with beseeching, entreating them with sound doctrine based on the word of God. It is the word of God which is quick and powerful. It's the word of God that pierces the heart. It's not a matter of human reasoning. It's not a matter of you know, figuring out a better argument than they have and you know, trying to trip them up. It's the scripture that we must know, that we must remember, that we must hold close, that we must adhere to. Because the supernatural power of the word of God is what reaches the heart of of the gainsayers. And we're all exhorted to do that, to know the scriptures, so we can give a reason to every man that asketh us for that reason of the hope that lies within us with meekness and fear, as Peter says. Are you ready to give an answer? Do you know the scriptures well enough so that you can answer anybody that God brings across your path when they have objections to God's great plan of salvation, when they have objections to the word of God, when they have objections to things that currently are affecting our culture in, in massive ways, things like evolution, things like the homosexual movement and gay marriage, things like, you know, all the different isms that are out there. You think of every cult that you can think of. Do you have the answer for the hope that lies within you that you can give to them with meekness and fear? Exhort the gainsayers. We need to be able by sound doctrine based on the faithful word to give the answer. Even a child can do this. You know, God will never bring you across someone that you are not prepared to answer for your point of spiritual growth. Now, you may have been slothful and not studied your lessons very well, but you know... No matter what temptation in life you face, no matter what kind of an adversary you face in the spiritual realm, the Word of God has the answer. You have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Do you know it? Are you able to exercise it, to parry and thrust, when the enemy approaches? Hold fast, adhere to it, stick to it like glue because it keeps you from sin, because it makes your way clean before God, 
because it enables you to exhort. Secondly, you are to convince the gainsayers, it says. The word convince, elenko, means to confront, to convict, to admonish, to tell a fault, to rebuke, to reprove. Sort of like the legal standards by clear and convincing evidence or beyond a reasonable doubt. You are to demonstrate with the scripture why they are wrong. Not just a matter of how you have figured it out why they're wrong, but you are to convince them by scripture why their doctrine is wrong. You first entreat by coming alongside presenting sound doctrine from the Bible. Then if there is resistance, you use confrontational apologetics. You can't do either of these things if you don't have the scripture held fast in your memory. The people who are teaching the false doctrine are described here in verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Now there are some interesting observations that we can make on that text there. These were Jewish believers on the island of Crete. We learn from the rest of the text and other passages that they had a tendency to put Christians back under the law of Moses. It tells us about them here in this verse that they were unruly. Anupatoktos means undisciplined, unsubdued, disobedient. Literally means not put under. And yet they were trying to put the Gentiles under the law when they themselves were undisciplined and rebellious. That's the same word that Paul uses four verses earlier in verse 6 when he's talking about the children of the elders in the church. Titus is to appoint elders there in Crete in the church. And he uses that same word in verse 6. Let me read verses 5 and 6 for you. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, now look at the next phrase, having faithful children. He's going to talk about the faithful word in verse 10. Now he's talking about faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. Anapatoktos. That's the same word that was being used of those who were teaching the false doctrine. There's the faithful word, there are the faithful children, serious qualifications for leadership set forth here in Titus 1, also in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The next thing we learn about these people in verse 10 is they were vain talkers and deceivers. In other words, it was not merely a matter of them believing false doctrine themselves, but they were making an impact on the church in Crete. They were talking. They were spreading their false doctrine. They were deliberately couching it in terms designed to deceive people. In particular, they must have made an impact on some of the young people in the church since their character quality was called to special attention when selecting elders for the church. A character quality that was being transferred from those false teachers to the children of men who were potential elders. False doctrine always results in false practice. False doctrine always leads to an ungodly lifestyle. You cannot separate the two. True doctrine leads to godliness. True doctrine leads to holy living. True doctrine leads to moral purity. False doctrine says it doesn't matter. False doctrine takes the grace of God and turns it into lasciviousness. And there are many so-called churches today where they are telling people it really doesn't matter what the Bible says. That was for all those people back there. We're under grace and so we can sin that grace may abound. And how does Paul respond? God forbid. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Dear people, the grace of God enables you and empowers you to live above that. It's not a license to sin. It's power to choose not to sin. What a difference in the concept of grace between what the New Testament teaches and what the apostates would teach. Oh, read the book of First and Second Peter. Read the book of Jude to find out about those apostates. 
After exhorting and convincing the gainsayer, Paul gives the third reason why scripture memory is so important in dealing with people who teach false doctrine. Verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things that they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. You must remember what you have been taught from scripture. Holding fast the faithful word. That's where he started, remember? Two verses earlier. That's the context. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. You must remember what you have been taught from Scripture. And here is the third step. If they don't respond to exhorting, if they don't respond to convincing, it says, whose mouths must be stopped. You must shut them up from what they are teaching because they are destroying families. It says so here, who subvert whole houses. That would include the children in the houses of the elders. What a warning. You know, growing up in the pastor's home doesn't really keep the children perfect. Things happen. They are infiltrated. In fact, they are prime targets. Oh, how I've seen spiritual battles in my own family among some of my children. Very, very important to understand that Satan always shoots at leadership. Some of them were believing false doctrine and it was producing the unruly, the disobedient, the wickedness in some of those children and young people. How a father has to watch his kids. How important it is, especially if he's a Christian father with possibility of leadership or in leadership. This is a serious matter, people. Why do we memorize scripture? Why do we keep it in memory, what we have been taught? Why do we stick to it? Why do we glue it to our brains? holding fast the faithful word. That's the only offensive weapon that God has given you in the spiritual arsenal. Ephesians chapter 6. Read the weaponry there. Read the armor there. There's only one offensive weapon, and it is the word of God. All the rest is defensive. The only offensive weapon with which you can fight the enemy is the word of God. Oh, we must memorize the scripture. You have to shut them up. You must prohibit them from teaching. You must keep them from spreading their false doctrine. And then it says they are deceivers, which implies that they know the truth, but they have chosen not to teach the truth. They've rejected it for a reason. And it tells you the reason. Teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. That means dirty money. They're doing it because they can make a buck off of it. False teachers always have some kind of a twist whereby they are going to make money off the flock with their false doctrine, a doctrine that sounds so good and makes people feel good. Paul calls it tickling the ears. Let me read you that passage. 2 Timothy 4.2 Preach the word. He doesn't say preach the theologians. He says preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. He's telling Timothy the same thing that he told Titus. Now look at verse 3, 2 Timothy 4, 3. For the time will come when they will not endure. What? Sound doctrine. Exactly the same thing that he was talking to Titus about. These two young Green behind the ears preachers. Paul was their mentor. He was training them in the scriptures. He was teaching them how to do battle in the spiritual realm and how to lead the congregations. And what did he emphasize? He emphasized sound doctrine based on the faithful word. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves, not dabble in, they will heap to themselves, teachers, having itching ears. Some of you have had dogs. Now, I'm not really an animal person, but I know that dogs like to be scratched behind the ears. You know, and uh, at various times in life, I have owned a dog, believe it or not. 
and I've owned more cats than I would ever like to count. Um, but they like to be scratched behind the ears, don't they? They come up, and if it's a cat, you know, lies on your lap, and it moves its head like this until you scratch behind the ears, and then it starts to purr, starts to purr. Paul is comparing some Christians to those kinds of animals. And he's saying, they have itching ears, and they love it when the false teachers scratch behind the ears, they tickle their ears. Oh, boy. How nice it seems. And they purr away. They're just so happy. Dear people, be careful of the teachers who tickle your ears. Those who have itching ears go to those teachers. And then it says, and they shall turn. That is, the false teachers will turn away the ears of the believers from the truth. And shall be turned unto fables. The only thing that you have that God says you are to keep in memory is the word of God. Not the fables, not the things that sound fun, not the things that tickle your itching ears, but sound doctrine based on the word of God. That's what you're to remember. A oh, Memorial Day for a Christian is to remember the word of God. You need to be aware of the culture in which the church is immersed. There are clear differences in various cultures and different groups of human beings. Of course, today it's politically incorrect to talk about general observations about various cultures or groups of people. But we need to be aware that there are certain tendencies for specific types of sin in each different culture. Paul says so here in verse 12. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. That means lazy gluttons. And he says in verse 13, This witness is true. In other words, there were certain things that, that characterized the Cretan culture that perhaps didn't characterize some other cultures where there was a lot of diligence, for example. But as you look at different people groups, they have, as a culture, developed certain types of sins. We see certain types of sins which have begun to develop and grow and expand like mushrooms in the dark in our culture here, where suddenly the basic rules of society and the basic foundations of society have been undermined and we see it crumbling around us. Yes, even in America. What is the only solution is the word of God. What is the only antidote for the poison? The word of God. What is the only way that you can keep from being infected by the disease? The word of God. Holding fast the faithful word. Keep in mind what you have been taught. The scriptures. Memorize it. Glue it to your brain. So that you can go on automatic pilot when things get chaotic, when the battle gets rough, when your plane is being fired at. You're on automatic Bible pilot and you go exactly where the scripture says, and so they miss you. It's the only way to win. You must know the word of God. Oh, dear people, how important that is. That brings us to the fourth reason for memorizing scripture in our arsenal of spiritual weapons. We are first to exhort then to convince, then to prohibit the false teaching. Then it says, Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. That's verse 13, second half of the verse. That's open confrontation. The progress to this point is gradated. It has a purpose that they may be sound in the faith. Our goal for other believers who have fallen into false doctrine is this. It's a rescue and recovery mission for those who are saved even when they are wrong. We're not out trying to destroy them. It's so that they may be sound in the faith. The Christian Judaizers were different from the Galatian Judaizers. The Christians, according to the text, had a mixture of pagan philosophy and Judaic, Judaic mysticism for some strange brew of weird doctrine that led to impure thoughts and actions. Look at verses 14 and 15. Not giving heed to Jewish fables, there's the Judaism stuff. And commandments of men, there's the pagan stuff that turn from the truth. 
Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Mind and conscience. Remember he told you to hold fast, to stick to like blue, the word of God, the faithful word, which will give you your sound doctrine. What controls your mind? What are you gluing it to? (laughs) Glue the Bible to your brain. Because you see, the false doctrine does what? It defiles the mind and the conscience. Oh, dear people, the Word of God is your greatest treasure. The Word of God is what men and women and children even have died for throughout the course of history because they knew this was the only answer. Cling to it, love it, memorize it, let it be the center and control of your life because that is the only way you can please Jesus. He is the living word. This is the written word. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. That he may be able by sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. Do you have it? Do you have it memorized? Do you have a scripture memory program? False doctrine always leads to immoral and rebellious practice rather than to good works. They profess, verse 16, they profess that they know God. They call themselves Christians. How many people out there call themselves Christians? Now, I know the percentage is getting a whole lot less these days where people throw up their hands and say they don't believe anything. But there are still many who claim to be Christians. They categorize themselves as Christians rather than Buddhists or Muslims or Hindus or something else. They profess that they know God. How do you know they don't know God? It tells you in the next half of the verse. But in works, they deny him. Dear people, either the Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. Your works don't save you, but your works are the result of salvation. A man who is truly saved comes to God as he is, lost, undone, sinful, dirty, filthy, unclean, and God takes him as he is, but God never leaves him as he is. The Spirit of God begins to take the Word of God and wash him and cleanse him because he is to reflect Jesus Christ in the way that he lives. These are people who have it in their mouth, but they don't have it in their life. Who profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to the Thy word. The word of God. How are you going to cleanse your heart? The word of God. How are you going to keep from sin? The word of God. How are you going to know what's right to do and what's wrong to do? The word of God. How do you know what God's standards are? The word of God. Are you memorizing scripture every day working on at least one Bible verse so that at the end of the week you can say, I have another verse of God's eternal word hidden in my heart and God has promised that that will keep me from sin. And the more you build, the more you recognize when you are being tempted. At first you don't know all the temptations that are out there. At first you don't know all the different ways the devil's going to trick you. But as you memorize God's word, you suddenly get strength in your soul. You suddenly have determination. You suddenly have a fervor and and an earnest desire to please Jesus. The Word of God. Memorial Day. 
Oh, there's so much more. Memorial Day, a day to remember the goodness of God. Psalm 145, 7. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and sing of thy righteousness. Memorial Day, a day to remember our great salvation, by which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you unless you have believed in vain. Memorial Day, a day to remember the Bible warnings against apostasy. Acts 20, 31. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one of you day and night with tears. Memorial Day, a day to remember practical Christian charity. Acts 20, 35, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Memorial Day, a day to remember the pit from which we were rescued. Ephesians 2, 11, wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called on circumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Memorial Day, a day to remember the prophetic teachings of Paul concerning the signs of the Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians 2.5, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? Memorial Day, a day to remember the resurrection of Christ. 2 Timothy 2.8, Remember Jesus Christ of the seed of David, risen from the dead according to my gospel. Memorial Day, a day to remember the words of the apostles concerning apostasy. Jude one seventeen. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he describes the apostates. Memorial Day, a day to remember God's original work in our midst and to repent to avoid impending chastening. This is written to the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2.5. A good doctrinally sound church. They knew all the right stuff. They had it categorized. They had their systematic theology. And here's what Jesus says to them. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. What is the cost? of failing to hold fast and keep in memory the scriptures that we have received and heard. Revelation 3.3 3 gives another warning. This time, it gives a warning to the church at Sardis. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and here he tells them, just like Paul told Titus, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. The warning to the church in Sardis, a church much like our church today here. In the culture of apostasy, in the culture of lasciviousness, only a few in Sardis had kept their garments white. It was a tiny congregation. They were given a warning not to give up. They were giving a warning to hold fast to the scriptures that they had been taught. Memorial Day, a day of memory, a day when Christians should remember the word of God. A day when a Christian must remember the word of God as the only source of true doctrine and the faithful Christian life. Back to our text. Remember what you were taught from the Bible. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. And you have promised that your word will not return void. It's not our arguments that don't return void. But my word shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and prosper in the thing whereto I have sent it. O oh, Father, your word has gone out today. You have called each one of us here to this place for a specific purpose. There are no accidents in your plan. It is your word that has been proclaimed. It is your word that is faithful. It is your word that is true. It is your word that you call us to understand, to memorize, to obey, to hold fast the faithful word as he hath been taught so that our lives will be changed and so that we will be prepared for spiritual battle so that we can exhort and convince the gainsayers. Father, cause us each to be faithful 
in the command that you have given. For someday it is to you that we will give an account. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number